So, Natasha, I'm really glad that you are taking the time to talk with me about the Universal Code of Conduct today. And um, I wanted to start out with the question of how did you learn about um, the effort that is going on to draft a Universal Code of Conduct? How did you get aware of this? Mainly through the strategy process 2020-2030, uh, in which uh, I was also involved, uh, mainly concerning the question of harassment. What impact do you think it will have on the community? Well, your home wiki is the French Wikipedia, but within that wiki you ha are... Um, supporting a very special community, a part of the community, you're supporting women and also non-binary um, persons identifying as female. So what impact do you have, um, do you think this will have on this special community? I think it's already having an impact in that there are ongoing discussions about what is harassment, how to deal with it, and how to deal with people who use uh, aggressive language to formulate their opinions. We have a, a founding principle, the fourth one, which is based on respect, but at the moment it's not applied. So having a code of conduct and discussing and debating about it certainly will bring awareness to the community as a whole about the need to moderate and to be careful about how we express our opinions so that we don't marginalize people in our communities because if we want knowledge to be available for everybody and uh, if we want everybody to be able to construct that knowledge, we do need a diversity of representation. At the moment, on the Francophone Wikipedia, there are 10% women contributors and 90% uh, others. So that means that a wide range of the population already is not represented. Now, if you look uh, a bit more finely into LGBT person, trans person, uh, that is even uh, worse. And we need a specific effort so that these people are welcome and that they do not face aggressive behaviors. Otherwise, they do not contribute and we don't get to, to have their input in the construction of, the, of, of our universal knowledge. Do you think this applies also when we don't think just about one wiki, the French Wikipedia, but people who many people, many Wikimedians contribute to several projects? maybe several projects in their own language, like Wikisource or Wikiquote, but also um, sometimes in different languages, or they contribute to those projects that are not language-bound, like Wikidata, Wikicommons. So do you see that it might have a different effect also for those people who work cross-project-wise? I think when you, you, you start with the project, whether it's Wikidata, Wikipedia, Wikisource, um, you get involved sometimes politically in the movement, in the chapters, and and then it is a cross-project movement. I speak French, German, and uh, English. And although I contribute mostly to Wikipedia, I came into Wikidata uh, because I needed to, um, to do queries, spark your queries. So it's a transversal project. And if you consider the francophone Wikipedia, and I do use the word francophone and not French, uh, it's, it's problematic that it's very Parisian-centered and French-centered. And uh, if you are Swiss, uh, I'm not Swiss, I'm, I'm French and I live in Switzerland, but if you are F Swiss or coming from Quebec, it's very hard to bring in your own opinion um, because people will talk to you about French institutions for the regulation of the language, for example, inclusive language. And it's, it's, we are on internet. This is our uh, territory and we, are, uh, we have to think globally about internet. And of course, nations and geography uh, is important, but we are in a cross-cultural and multi-language project. 
For example, uh, some contributors of Les Pages uh, created Noircir Wikipedia, and they are on two projects, Engrenchenado Wikipedia, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly because I don't speak Spanish, and they, they do Wikidata and the Spanish and the, and the Francophone uh, Wikipedia all at the same time. So this is a, a perfect example uh, because they are Afro-descendant and they want to decolonize Wikipedia using their own term, uh, which I think it's important to let people use their own terms of engagement and not accusing them aggressively all the time of puff pushing and being social justice warriors because this is not, uh, th these are not facts, these are judgments. <laughs> Thank you very much for opening up the perspective beyond what you yourself are doing to those other perspectives of those women that work closely with you but have their own projects and have their own views and their own experiences and bringing this into this um, conversation. Beyond those questions of impact, do you have anything else that you would like to talk about now that the drafting is has started, is going on, but um, that the Universal Code of Conduct is not yet finished. It's important to think uh, how it will be enforced, first of all, uh, from, the, from the, the things that I have read about in the open source community. The, in the open source community, all the main projects have had contributor covenants starting in 2003. And so we have, um, we have a backlog of experiences about applying code of conducts. So I think, uh, first of all, the Wikimedia movement cannot do without a contributor covenant anymore. It's, it's, uh, it's incredible to think we have been uh, doing without so many years. And... And we have to think about, look closely into the open source experience to see what worked and what didn't work. And there are some things we know do not work. Like the worst thing on earth we can have is a code of conduct that is not applied. A code of conduct which is not applied sends the wrong message. It means we have a code of conduct, but we wash our hands uh, and it's just there as a kind of washing. Uh, code of conduct washing. And it gives a message to the wrong message, ambiguous messages to new contributors is that when they experience harassment and they think, oh, there's a code of conduct, let's see uh, what we can do. And then if they get a response out, oh, it doesn't apply, go and see with your local Wikipedia. Um, we do not, uh, we can't answer this because this and this and that without uh, giving even an emotional response, because what people need first is an emotional response beyond technicity and we will examine this and then you wait three months. Um, this is the worst thing that can happen. And then when you apply code of conduct, what works and what doesn't is that the all public and transparent uh, option does not work because it is fragilizing the victim that is uh, being harassed, like all her, she's already, people are in a fragile state and you expose them to the community and community can just answer things um, out of the blue, like you would have 200 contributors contributing one line, but they do not uh, realize how their words are going to be um, taken by somebody who is fragile. And sometimes one word, one word is enough to make somebody feel very, very bad. And it's not the intention that counts. It's that for a person who receives 200 messages from different parts of the projects, which are not connected, which might not be nasty messages, but all that together, that is constituting of mobbing. What doesn't work is the all public option And what is important is how the accused person reacts. Because if this person goes viral, then you experience a kind of Gamergate backlash where the victim is being accused 
of accusing the other of harassment. And there, everybody goes mad and nobody is a, able to decipher the complexity of the thing. And then if you let it go, at one point, people will become so aggressive and angry, you don't know uh, whether you should not ban everybody at the end, which is a disa total disaster and chaos. So that doesn't work. What, what could work, and I think, uh, you need to think about that when drafting the code of conduct is you need the conversation to be private, but you need the community to be um, to be aware of how it's going on of the process. And maybe the community could elect people that they are um, that they they trust, which would go to a kind of an arbitration community, an elected body that would look at it with both new eyes and eyes from the outside and from the inside, paying attention to the representativity in this elected council. And then this elected council would issue a, an advice or a decision, I don't know, and then post back, this is what has been decided. And nobody goes uh, and fumbles in the dustbins of history and the aggressor and the victims are s protected because an aggressor can change and maybe they don't want things to go public. Um, uh, people can do things at one point and then they can change and it's not correct just to, to that anybody can go and take out these diffs and continue uh, having arguments for years and years afterwards. So although I'm all for transparencies and openness, uh, after being involved in uh, Wikimedia France um, bo um, Board of Conflict of Interest uh, Management, I did realize that not everything ne needs to go public and it's even dangerous. But you need people to be accountable, to be elected, they, they, there needs to be an accountability so that you, there's a process that people agree on. And this is very important when drafting the code of conduct. And I think you cannot just draft the code of conduct and not think about this um, in parallel. Thank you very much for those insights. And I hope um, you will also take part in the discussions in what we call phase two, where we will be talking about how can enforcement work in detail, who should be enforcing what, what should be the reporting channels. So I'm very much looking forward to that. But for now, I want to thank you um, and wish you a wonderful day. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, all the best of luck.